So, I was saying that, welcome to this new episode of Miss Strategies Middle Game Show. This is Material Imbalances number three. We have checked several examples on material imbalance, especially from this side that sacrifices material. So we have seen, for instance, the rook sacrifices by Kramnik and Topalov, their recent rook sacrifices. Last week we were discussing Petrosian's exchange sacrifices, his trademark exchange sacrifice. And this week we will flip the coin and see everything from another perspective because sacrificing material doesn't always win. Um, most likely when your material down, you should be worse. And today we will see how to play when you are an exchange up. So when your opponent sacrifices an exchange or loses an exchange, how shall you play in order to convert your advantage? Converting our advantage is our today's topic. And there's the chessboard this way. I never know in which direction is the chessboard. There you go. So let's bring up the first game. And uh, I hope that now everything is fine. Let me know, guys, here in the chat. Hello to everybody who is here live on Chess24. By the way, for those of you who watch this on YouTube and you were asking, how can you join us live? Well, you should go to chess24.com and go on watch shows. And there you will see the schedule for each show. So you should be here when it is scheduled, then I will be able to read your comments live. That is how you can join us live on watch shows on chess24.com. So as I was mentioning, we should open our games for today. And uh, hmm, here they are. Good. I think good. No, doesn't want to show the game. Wait a second. Today, Anna is even comes here than usual. Why is that? I'm so, oh, now, now it's there, now it's there. I was like, I see it, you don't see it. There you go, Topalo versus Swidler. Peter Swidler is such a nice person, I adore him, but this game he is unfortunately going to lose against Vaseline Topalov, who is also a nice person. So I'm rooting for all these players, I get on well with them, especially Peter, who I was lucky enough to meet in Hamburg. This was a Grunfeld, you should watch the Grunfeld video series by Peter Swidler. That's a brilliant video series if you want to learn the Grunfeld. But this is a game where he played the Grunfeld in 2006 and he was not very successful in this game. So this is one of those few games <laughs> that Peter lost with the Grunfeld. Here black is already worse. You can see that there's this very dangerous passed pawn on c6, super annoying and white pieces are really active. So. In order to do something, Peter went rook d8. Um, and his idea was that after rook b7, which is the good move, that, good move and that's what Vaseline played, he was going to sacrifice an exchange. So if he did not do this, but if he was playing just passive, then white was going to win the a7 pawn. He still has this very strong fast pawn on c6. And on top of that, all the black pieces are passive. And look at the queen on h6, it's completely out of place. So the queen is not even helping black's pieces to do something against this c6 passed pawn. Therefore, Peter's idea was rook d8, and after rook b7, rook takes d3. And now he will get a bishop and a pawn. He will win the c6 pawn, so he gets rid of the passed pawn by sacrificing an exchange. And in this position, um, well, you can see that, yes, black has a bishop and a pawn, but it doesn't look like those positions that we were observing the previous weeks, does it? It doesn't look like black has so much as a compensation, especially if you see that white can immediately take a pawn on a7. So that would mean that after rook takes a7, this is only a piece for a rook, which in this position would not be enough compensation. There's no back rank anything. If you take on f1, the king will have the e2 square. So this position is just bad, but it's also bad by not capturing on a7 because Topalov thought that, well, that pawn is hanging, but it's going to be hanging forever. You cannot protect the a7 pawn. So he went back rook a1, forcing the trade of queens or the retreat of the black queen. He can take even now, but it's more important to protect the e4 pawn. So he goes queen, a, queen e1 
And after rook c4, this is the first moment when you need to think. And that reminds me of the time to think image that we did not have last time. And today I will bring it up because it was sort of ridiculous that I was covering the camera with the beautiful Tata DHS and Gibraltar poster. So that's not the purpose of that poster. We should have the time to think, but you can start thinking why I bring up the time to think. So it is why to move and the pawn is hanging on e4. You should decide what you do about that. Let's see. Good job, everybody. I see that you paid attention last week. And in general, you know that when you are on exchange up, you are aiming to trade a pair of rooks. And we discussed this last week, but let me just repeat it because it's so important. When you have an exchange up, you want to get rid of a pair of rooks because that would leave you in with a position where you're the only person that has a rook. So your rook, the only remaining rook on the board, gains lots of power because that's the only rook. So simple and yet sometimes we forget about this basic principle. So remember that when you're in exchange up, you want to trade rooks in general. Don't blunder anything for the sake of trading, but in general you want to get rid of the opponent's rook. So you are the only one who has a rook. Naturally. Peter Swidler knows that he has to keep the rook on the board in order to have some kind of a compensation. So he went rook c2. Um, and here many moves could be played by white, h3, queen e3, or the move that was chosen by Topalov, rook b1. He overprotects the back rank. You will soon see what is his plan and why he goes rook b1. Bishop g4, h3, just to make sure that there will be no back rank threat any time and also to decide to force the opponent do something about his bishop and now rook a3 so this was his idea by playing rook b1 he could not move the b rook to the third rank you see that there's this bishop on e6 and you cannot move the a1 rook away from the back rank because of the threat of rook c1 so he solved it in a sm very smart way and this was very deep so i did not want you to think about this move because i wouldn't have played rook b1 probably in this position it looks passive but it is a very deep thought rook b1 in order to go rook a3 a couple of moves later and this is a rook lift the rook is heading to e3 so if this pawn is taken then you can go rook e3 bishop will be hanging so Queen c4 is forced, and now you take the e5 pawn. And look at those rooks. This is what we were not seeing in Petrosian's games. Whenever Petrosian sacrificed an exchange, it was because it was an, a very close position. He always made sure that he closed the position as much as possible. He didn't give any open fires to the opponent's rooks. And in this position, this is completely the opposite. There are so many open fires. Next most will be doubling rooks on the seventh rank. So once you activate your rooks and you start attacking the f7 square in this position, it will mean that black's pieces will have to be tied down to the defense and you can activate the white queen as well, which is 
in this position the most passive piece, but we cannot activate it until Black's pieces are attacking us. So you will activate your rooks, force the opponent to the defense, and then you can bring the queen as well. You will win the game because you have so many open files for your heavy pieces. This was not played, of course. Um, a6 was Peter's choice, and after rook e3, bishop b5, once again, it's time to think how would you continue here? So you managed to kick away the bishop from e2, and there was a reason for playing this rook e3, but maybe I shouldn't confuse you. Just let me know what would you play in this position as white. Good job guys, I think Duke Crusher was the first to say it and also GM Rio, Rio Del Che, Karsten 1, 2, 1, 2, 4, uh, so you have all said Rook C1 and that is the correct solution. It is true that the B file is in theory an open file, but you cannot take advantage of this open file because there's a bishop on B5 preventing you from using the B file. So it is a very good idea to look for another open file in this case the c file and also ask the black rook what does he want to do always the trade of rooks will favor us he does not want to trade so he goes rook a2 um but at least we got the c file so we cannot force him to exchange rooks if he doesn't want but we always gain something in this case the c file uh, just for a moment if you want to have a look at why this position is so bad with the exchange of rooks. Just as an example, look at the difference. It's not winning on the spot, of course, but you will sooner or later be very passive as black because white will start activating his pieces and you don't have any rooks. So after, for instance, queen c7, threatening rook f3, this is a very annoying position for black not just annoying, but lost position. And uh, yeah, it's just so sad because you don't have any counterplay as black. Not even, I mean, not counterplay, but you don't even have any tricks. So it's very difficult to blunder as white in this position. You've got the control, you are, you're winning and your pieces are much better. Rook f3 will come and black's pieces will be totally passive unless you blunder something. This is winning. Not immediately, but you need to be patient. So these are positional advantages. A material advantage that is an exchange up is also a long-term advantage. So you cannot win on the spot. Be patient and you will convert this. We will see positions like this, so don't worry. But right now we will see that Peter wants to keep the rook on the board. And that's what your opponents will do if they know that you, they shouldn't trade rooks. So you see that after bringing the rook to the C file, we place it on the seventh rank, that's where it should be. Attacking the f7 pawn and next move will be rook f3. So one rook is working from the seventh from the seventh rank. I was going to say seventh five, but it doesn't make sense. Seventh rank, and the other rook will come from the third rank. So that was a brilliant rook lift with rook a3, rook e3, and now rook f3. It has to be prevented, but the only way to protect the f7 pawn poor f7 pawn is bishop e8 and now poor bishop so this is a horrible position unfortunately for peter after rook f3 queen g5 now the only thing that white has to do is 
to bring his queen and this is where Peter Swidler resigned because this is a completely hopeless position. He still has a bishop and a pawn for the rook which normally could well not be equal as a rook but it's close to it. If he had one more pawn we could say that the material balance was more or less equal but even if he had an extra pawn in this position for instance on b6 it would not mean that his position is not lost. He's lost because his pieces are very passive, his pieces are passive because we, the ones who have two rooks on the board, we, were managed, we managed to use the open files and ranks for our rooks. So once you have active rooks, it is very likely that you will win a position with an exchange up. And just a few more moves as an example, for instance, rook d2, if you don't believe that his position is so bad, Let's just make a few more moves. Queen c4 threatening rook takes f7 because a good stuff about having extra material is that you can give it back anytime. So once you see a winning combination like rook takes f7, you can, you can simply give back the exchange for, for instance, a mating attack or a winning pawn endgame. You will see many times that when you have material up, you can convert that advantage into another kind of advantage. So here rook takes f7 is a horribly strong threat. Black has to go king h6 in order to prevent it. But now queen b4 would be threatening queen f8. Ouch, so king has to go back. Now we bring the queen from the seventh rank. This is just an example. So these are not the only good moves, but I want to show you how powerful the heavy pieces can be when they have open files and open ranks. So now we have two heavy pieces on the seventh rank. We have another one from the F file attacking F7 once again. We are threatening to capture on F7 if we want. So checks like rook D1 doesn't help because the king is very safe on H2 while the black king is suffering on G7. So the F7 pawn is a huge target and the A6 pawn is hanging. The E8 bishop is horribly passive and will be hanging in many positions. So this is dead lost and Peter Swidler resigned a couple of moves before because he saw this coming. Um, well, we should learn from this game. Of course, th there's nothing that we should blame about the exchange sacrifice. Black's position was bad anyway. So what we need to see is that even though for a moment, in this moment, white is not that active, especially the white queen that was on the back rank for a while, white had to protect his pawn on e4 with his queen. You normally don't use the queen for protecting pawns, right? So this was just for the moment, but you need to find a way to activate your heavy pieces. And the queen, of course, the most important, you shouldn't be defending with the queen a single pawn. So after rook c4, a very important move was rook b4, you want to trade rooks. And after rook c2, Topalo found this beautiful idea of bringing back the B rook to the back rank in order to protect the C1 square and his idea is to go rook A3 and from there rook E3 or rook F3 depending on the position but that's a beautiful rook lift. Of course rook C1 is another option now that all the heavy pieces are on the back rank so it's either the rook lift that he can play for or rook C1. In either case, this was the way to play. Bringing back all the pieces to the back rank, it looks so passive, but it had the idea of activating them. So even if momentarily you need to be passive, if you see the plan, it is you know that you are not going to be passive for the whole game. It is just for a move or two moves or three moves, but you have a plan. So after a couple of moves, Topalov managed to activate his heavy pieces. Even rook e3 is not like the most active move. It chases the bishop away, but it is now protecting the e4 pawn. So that's not an open file, but it was for the reason of covering the c1 square, because in this position, you cannot go rook c1, but with the rook on e3, not allowing the queen to protect the c1 square anymore, you can go rook c1 next move. So that was also a deep idea. And after gaining the c5 and bringing the rook to the seventh rank, then the other rook to f3, this position was completely winning. Once he managed to activate his rooks, this is what I was explaining in another position, that once you manage to activate 
most of your pieces and you force the opponent to defend, you will then be able to bring the remaining pieces, the pieces that you were defending with. Because now black is not attacking anymore, he has to be protecting everything that he can with his pieces. So this was one of the examples, but we have two more. So let's jump right in to this game by Vladimir Kramnik against Vulgar Gashimov, the late Vulgar Gashimov. Uh, he was, of course, a very strong player and uh, a player of my age, so I'm so sorry that I have to be speaking of him in past tense. Um, unfortunately, life is not very fair always. Um, anyway, this game he's playing with the Black Pieces against Kramnik, and uh, this was a Blitz Championship, the World Blitz Championship from 2009. Um, he's in a bad position, so this is not one of his best games. Uh, after queen f3, Kramnik's position is basically winning. He has no material up, not even a pawn up, but you see so many factors that make his position winning. He's got more space. I think that's easy to understand why he has more space with, with this pawn chain that looks like a V. Then he's got a beautiful outpost. We have been talking about the good knight. Now this is a monster knight on d5. That's an outpost and he managed to place his knight there. On top of that, he's got another knight that can replace this d5 knight if it's needed. If black manages to trade the d5 knight, you have another knight that can jump to d5. So he's got more space. He's got a monster on d5. He will be able to open the f5 Anytime he wants, he can triple on the f file and then open it or capture. So he's weakening Black's king side. And Black's pieces are very sad. So if it's not only about White's beautiful and powerful pieces, but also the Black passive pieces. And by that, I mean that I want to color with red. Why I cannot color this? Bad piece, bad piece. And because of the lack of space, also the heavy pieces are not really good, but that's because this position is closed and you are not the one who can open it, unfortunately for black. And it gets even worse very quickly because after knight g5, which was an attempt to be active, Kramnik took this and the reason why he took it, that was a good bishop, but he gave it up because he saw that he wanted to go f6 here and that pawn is a pawn that many times is worth a piece because <laughs> it's such a painful thing to have this f6 pawn in your stomach. If you look at the black king on g8 and this f6 pawn, um, of course there is still a bishop, uh, the dark squared bishop. I'm not saying that we will give mate as white because I could imagine a mate with a queen on g7, but there's this bishop. But the bishop will be so passive that basically, thanks to the f6 pawn, we are a virtual piece up. On top of that, you can win an exchange right now, knight e7, because the move f6 cuts the connection between the g5 square, the queen, protecting the e7 square. So, ouch, we are winning an exchange immediately. But you know what? Kramnik didn't even want to take the exchange. This is a perfectly fine move to take the rook on c8, but he thought that this knight on d5 was stronger than the rook, so why bother? He wanted to keep the knight. So that's what he does. He goes h4 and he will be winning because he managed to make this h8 bishop basically unexistent. The h6 queen almost trapped. A queen is not supposed to be on h6 having only two possible moves where you don't lose the queen immediately. I mean, what a queen is that? So black has two horrible pieces and that's why even after giving this check on e7, Kramnik didn't <laughs> take the rook. He doesn't need it. He says, I'm gonna jump to d5 with the other knight. Why bother taking the rook when these knights, the knight on e7 and the knight on d5, are stronger. So basically this game is an example for material imbalances from both sides because here Kramnik would rather have the knights on the board than capture black's rook. What happened later was rook c e8 and now <laughs> look at this move. King h2. I'll show you once again. You're winning and you play king h2 and this 
is what you should learn about positional advantage. You are not in a rush. You can make moves like king h2, king h1, king g1. It doesn't make so much sense to triangulate with your king in this position, but if you feel safer on h2 with the king, then play it. You have all the time in the world to convert this advantage into a full point. There's no rush. On top of that, this king h2 has another idea. It's not just that it might be safer on h2, but it's protecting the h3 square, so you can go bishop h3 next move if you want to exchange the light squared bishop of black. Bishop g4 was played enough to queen f2, bishop e6, look at that move, bishop h3. So <laughs> Kramnik is trading the only the one and only active please, act, please, active piece of black. Look at this position. How sad all the black pieces, I mean all the black pieces, not green, but red. Look at these pieces, so sad. And the only piece that is doing something is the e6 bishop. So Kramnik makes sure that you will not have you won't even have one single good piece in this position. This is just horrible. He's taking away your last good piece. So whether you take the bishop or you capture on d5, you will have to give away your bishop. He took the knight, knight takes d5, knight b7, trying to activate the knight, but it's taking a long time to activate it. You need to maneuver to d8 and then e6, and then you would have an outpost on d4, but you won't have time for it because after bishop d7, you have to act. And if you play rook d8, problems come because, ouch, you can even play g4 as well. You don't have to bother about the bishop. g5, if you push g5, you have won the black queen. There's no square, he cannot go anywhere. So g4, threatening to trap the queen, and if he takes your pawn, you come back with the bishop, but you are opening the king side because yes, even though we love having a positional advantage in a closed position and maneuver all the way, all 20 maneuvers you can carry out. If it's a closed position, you can do so many things, so many maneuvers, but at some point you've got to open the position. And here was the moment to open the position. You will bring the king to the g file. You will bring your rook to the h file and open the position with h5. The king is on h7, the queen is on h6. So you should aim for opening the h file and give mate or win the queen or both. So this is lost. This is a bad position after bishop d7. Gashimov decided that he will give up the rook. This position is bad no matter what. Now Kramnik took it because it's not the knight that he's giving up for the rook, he gave up his bad bishop for the rook. So that's the difference between capturing a rook with your beautiful monster knight from d5 on an outpost or bringing your worst piece, the light square bishop, because of the pawn chain that was the piece that was the least active in White's camp. So he won the exchange with the worst piece that he had. And now, now that we have won the exchange, it is your turn to think. What do you do when you have an exchange up? We have learned one principle before, which was that you should trade rooks. Now there are no rook trades here, but before you can trade rooks, it seems that you've got to do something. So what is the other very important principle that you should know when you're an exchange up? Time to think about that and suggest a plan. I don't want one single move. I would like a plan.
goodness me, I need to catch my breath. Um, I thought that I was streaming to my usual audience, but I see that uh, Grandmaster Jonathan Hawkins is here. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm recommending Jonathan's book, Amateur to I Am to Everybody. So if you want to become an international master, you should read that book. That's, that is a really great book, that's my recommendation. And I'm really stunned that I have Grandmaster audience as well. Uh, and of course, Jonathan is right that you should open the A5. That's the way to take advantage of the exchange app. You should open files. You need open files for the Rook. Um, I, try, I try to get back to my normal breathing rhythm and ignore the fact that people higher rated than me and with much more knowledge than what I have are also watching my shows. So A4, A5, that is the correct plan. You need to open the A5. After 96, of course, A5 and Rook B8. So simple, we're gonna take it, we're gonna bring the rook to the A file, we're gonna double rooks on the A file, or take this weak pawn on B6, or both. And so that's what happened. The knight actually managed to get to D4. You remember that this black knight was on A5, it was a horrible piece. It took this knight a while to bring it to D4, that's the, an outpost. But Unfortunately for black, it's not just an exchange down, but his bishop and his queen are still awful. Those are dead pieces. So rook takes b6, it's just an exchange up, and now you take it even this pawn, you have a passed pawn on b5, you will bring the other rook to a1, and it's just completely winning. So after g takes, g takes, Gashimov resigned in this position. If you want to know why he resigned, it's because it's made in 10 moves. Well, I'm just kidding. But yes, that's what the engine says. It's made in 10 moves. Doesn't matter what black does. You can try it at home to figure out how it is made in 10. So this was Kramnik's game. And what we should learn from it is that the other principle when we have an exchange of First of all, before we have an exchange up, remember that Kramnik didn't want to take the rook. He didn't want to capture it. He thought that his knight was a lot more valuable than the c8 rook. I'm coloring with the wrong color, but anyway, that's a monster on d5. So he didn't go knight e7, or yes, he did, but not to take the knight, not to take the rook. He brought his other knight to d5. He was playing with these two horribly powerful pieces, the knight on e7 and the knight on d5. And then he actually used his worst piece, the light squared bishop, to either trade black's only active piece, that's his only good piece, the e6 bishop. And Kramnik was so cruel that even if it's a blitz game, but he wanted to make sure that black has zero good pieces. So after the trade of bishops or taking on d5, this position for black is a nightmare, literally a nightmare. You have zero pieces, zero chance. And yeah, he gave up the rook, but Kramnik took it with his worst piece. Remember that he didn't want to take that rook with his good knight. He wanted to take, to take it with a bad bishop. That's what he did. And here, the first principle, when you have an exchange up, you should open the positions, the open the position because rooks need open files. I'm still nervous. So next game, last game. Remember those two principles because you might need them. You need to open the position, open files, open ranks for the rooks when you have an exchange up. And you also want to trade a pair of rooks in most positions because you are the one who wants to remain with the rook on the board. The opponent will not have any if you manage to trade rooks. This is our last game for today. Anish Giri versus Vishy Anand from the London Chess Classic Blitz, a Blitz event in 2014. So this is the most recent game from the ones that I showed you today. And after knight g1, this position is slightly better for white. What happened in the game was a blunder by Vichy. He went rook f4, and I would like you to tell me why this is a blunder. What happens after rook f4? What is the move that will refute rook f4? It is time to think and for me to catch my breath.
All right, I've just been told that this is way too easy. Well, sometimes you need to find easy moves on the board in order to win an exchange. So, of course, if you train with Miss Tactics or you use the Tactics Trainer Hero Chess 24, then you are very sharp and you spot immediately the winning move, which is h5. And yeah, of course, Amish played h5. And after this move, there's just no way that you can keep the rook, queen, g5 and knight f3 you have to give up your rook and once again we reach a position where the opponent has a piece in this case a bishop and a pawn for the rook um, this position is a lot more close than the ones that we have seen before so well the previous uh, in the previous one it was totally closed but it was very uh, easy to open it this one seems to be more open than the previous position but you will see that it won't be that easy to activate the rook but what is great is that right now it is white to move so what will you play here as white very quickly Now that was real quick. Everybody shouting, exchange rooks, rook trade, rook takes f7. Yes, 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 <laughs> you should trade rooks. That's this, the most simple. If you follow this principle, most of the times you will be right unless you trade a very active rook for a horribly bad rook. So of course you should always evaluate whether your piece, the one that you are trading, is on the same level of activity. If your piece is a lot stronger, a lot more active, then probably you want to keep it on the board. So don't just listen to me and say, I always need to exchange rooks when I have an exchange up. No, you should trade rooks in general and make sure that you don't trade ever a piece that is super powerful for a passive piece. And that's not just about the exchange up, that's not just about rooks. In any position, when you are offered a trade of pieces or you want to offer a trade of pieces, you should know if that, tra that trade favors you. So whose piece is stronger? If your one is much stronger, do not trade. That simple. Queen takes f7 and now queen d3. Uh, you see that white is improving his pieces. So he has improved his queen. He has improved his knight. But what are we going to do about the rook? How to activate the rook? Well, the only <laughs> file that we can try to take advantage of is the h file because yeah the c file is also a semi-open file but i guess nobody would say that rook c1 is a good move here yeah no don't buy that so rook h1 and the plan will be that after knight f5 well black is trying to do something g4 not just kicking the knight away but next move can be g5 Maybe this was not the most accurate, but this is a blitz game. So of course, if you analyze this, then probably the engine will tell you what uh, it tells me. When I analyzed it, that king g3 was perhaps the best. You safeguard the f4 square and after knight g6, you bring the queen and you have this long maneuver bringing the knight to from e1, d3, and from there it can jump to either f4 or c5. And yeah, it's a long game. You are an exchange up, but it's a closed position. So you don't expect to win immediately just because you are material up. It's going to take you maybe 20 moves. You got to be patient. Even if it takes you more than 20 moves, you got to be patient. So this is what could have been the most precise. Anish went g5 and uh, Vichy responded with knight g6. 
all these moves are criticized by the engine, but it's a blitz game, so we will not care about what the engine says. We will just see this as a game between two humans. Queen e3, of course, you don't wonder your queen. That's a third principle when you're in exchange up. No, just kidding. But queen e3 is a great move, and now you're threatening to take on h6 after h5. Well, I will show you a funny line. Knight f4 could be a tempting check, right? But you can play king g3. Remember that you don't... You've always liked these squares for the knight. We discussed this one, we discussed the good knight topic. So a knight on f5, on d5, because we were looking at it from white's perspective. And we, we always said that that's great when you can jump to those squares, but you should make sure that your knight stays there. So if you cannot support your knight on f4, do not jump there. You have to move again. Yes, you have one more check, but look at this. Active king, even in the middle game. Sometimes it can happen because here, actually, your king is safe on g4. This check, you will just say thanks to the opponent for giving up the knight. You're not getting mated, so just make sure that you calculate that this is not mate. Your king is safe on h4. It's funny, but if you are a rook up and you did not get mated, then it's a good stuff. King g4, cool play by white, attacking with the king. The knight is basically trapped, he has to go g6, but yeah, this position is really bad. With the king, the active king, going for the black king. King g4, yeah, don't, don't learn this part that much because it doesn't work in most games. But sometimes, very few times, you shall forget that the king has always the king always needs safe places, sometimes you can march ahead, even with the queens on the board. Of course, this is heading towards an endgame, so in an endgame you would know that you should bring your king. Here, this is not yet an endgame, but close to it. So, oh, um, I will just move to the next one. Sorry, I'm, uh, I have windows popping up, so... I shall go back to the game and show you that h5 was played, of course, this should not be taken because then you blunder your rook, do not blunder. Uh, king f1, stepping away from this knight f4 move. And after knight e7, knight h4, g6, once again, it is your turn to think, and I won't give you much time because I think you know the answer. You shall detect the piece that is not active and do something about it. Well done everybody! It is the rook that you need to improve and the rook lift always comes handy. Rook h3 heading towards f3. That's a semi-open file. <laughs> it's a semi-open because you have a pawn on f2. So we will manage to pretend that there's no f2 pawn. We will bring the rook to f3 and then we have our open file. The one and only open file in this position. So it doesn't matter what black does. He can't do anything about rook f3, and after rook f3, you probably will also play rook f6. This is not looking good for black. He played knight f5, but after knight takes f5, you can't even use your pawns in order to close the f file, because if you close the f file, you have another disadvantage. Pass pawn. This is even worse than an open f file. And if you take with the g pawn, 
same story, past pawn, and your king is horribly weak. You can't take this pawn because of rook g3. Your queen is hanging, the h5 pawn is hanging, this is resigned. So knight takes f5, queen takes f5, after rook f3, queen g4, and it's simply traded queens because in this position, all you want is, simplic is simplicity. And this is not only about the exchange up, but in general, whenever you have material up, you do want to simplify the position in general. <laughs> Please remember that these principles work in most of the cases, but not every position is different. So remember the principles. When you're on exchange up, you want to open the position because rooks need open files and open ranks. Secondly, you want to trade rooks most of the time because it's a lot better when you are the only player that has a rook. And third, in general, you want to trade pieces. So it's not only about trading rooks, but you do want to trade your queen, you do want to trade knights, and so on and so on. As long as you trade pieces that are, not, that are equally active as the opponent's ones, or your pieces are more passive. Do not trade a very powerful piece for a bad piece. These are the general principles that you should have in mind when you are playing with an exchange up. And this position, after king g7, king e2, actually Vichy resigned. Now, why did he resign in this position? You can tell me. What is the plan here as white? I know that this is an endgame already, but how do you win this position as white? You are an exchange up. Tell me the plan. Where's my time to think? Oh, time to think. That was real quick. So I see that you do not only spot tactical motives immediately in a second, but you also see positional plans very quickly. And here the only thing that White has to do in order to activate his rook is to bring the king to d3, protect the d4 pawn, and then you can go rook f6 and you will cash in because you're gonna capture everything you can. You will have an e5 pass pawn it's likely that you will also take more pawns. The b7 pawn is very weak. Also, if the king goes uh, towards your pass pawn, then the g6 pawn can fall. It all collapses because you have an exchange up with a rook that's gonna be very active. And look at this poor bishop on a7. So the only thing, why I cannot color it red? Red, please, magic. This bishop, is horrible. The only thing you should not do when you have material up is to be impatient. So you don't want to go crazy and go for activating your rook immediately. Maybe it's winning too, but why the rush? Why to give the opponent chances? So you don't you do not want to do this. The bishop is a lot more active. So even if you calculate that this is winning for you, I don't want you to do this. Why bother? Do not ever calculate moves like that. If you have a simple plan, this is a lot more simple to bring the king. In the endgame, anyway, you should activate your king. So bring your king, protect your only target, your only weakness. That's the only target that black has. And then you can activate your rook. Be patient. That is actually a fourth and perhaps most important principle. Um, another thing I want to go back to, so this was, a, this was a game. Yeah, let's just go back to the moment where this blunder happened. Of course, it can happen to anybody, especially in a blitz game. So the best players of the world, and this was a, a very simple blunder, losing the exchange. We traded a pair of rooks. Then we were improving our pieces. Oh, the rook needs an open file, so you try to open the h5 for the rook. 
and then moves later we reach the position where we finally had a rook lift so when you don't have an open file you should try to open it you should try to open the position somehow or if you cannot because now what do you do here with the f pawn you can't really start pushing it right that would be crazy be creative rook lifts rook lifts are so useful even with lots of pawns on the board with lots of pawns on the second rank or with many pieces that disturbing your rook with a rook lift you can bring your rook to another file so a rook lift is a useful tool uh, in order to activate your rook we have brought our rook to the f file and after that this game was over remember that anish went for the most simple continuation he could have kept the queen on the board but why bother remember that when you have material up you want a simple position every end game will be winning if you have an active rook so why bother having the opponent's queen on the board maybe he could try to give perpetual check if he has an active queen you do not want that you want to trade simplify the position and do not be in a rush always be patient bring your king then activate the rook in this case and by being patient i also mean the game the first game that we saw between Topalov and Swidler and you remember the moment when I asked you how do you protect the pawn after rook c4 so some of you I was ha very happy that nobody said it but I will mention this because I think it's a very instructive a very instructive mistake f3 so for those who might watch this on YouTube and might think of f3 here's why you should never do that it weakens the second rank and after rook c2 suddenly black has counterplay this position with rook b4 is winning for white you make one mistake you play f3 and now black is better this is the difference between one good move or one bad move you make a mistake and suddenly you are even worse you are worse because this rook on the second rank is horribly strong and you cannot challenge it you have no way to offer the trade of rooks next move will be queen g5 and bishop h3 and how do you protect your king so suddenly it is a black who is attacking with an exchange down this is a good exchange down you have enough counterplay be careful you should not think that retreating moves are passive moves Yes, it looks passive because the rook was more active on b7, but sometimes it's needed. The queen is only one, it's not active. You have to bring back your rook to b4. That's not the most active either. And he even brought back his rook to b1. All the heavy pieces are on the back rank, but this is just a temporary setup. So sometimes you need to play moves like this, but it's because of a long, a long term plan well, not so long term, few move plan. So his few move plan was that he can bring the rook from the third rank or after playing rook b1, he can also go rook c1. Depending on how the opponent plays, you decide whether you want to go for the rook lift or play rook c1 or both. So these were the examples of today. And I hope that you remember the principles that we have discussed. So first of all, exchange up, you need to open files. You need open files, open ranks. Secondly, you should aim for the trade of rooks because then you will be the only one that has a rook on the board that's useful stuff too third in general trades are good for you you can go for an end game because most of the end games will be winning for you but never trade a piece that is very active for you and very bad for the opponent you should then just avoid the trade of pieces even if it's a rook for instance you have a very active rook you have two very active rooks and you know that you should aim for the trade of rooks do not trade it for a passive rook you only trade when your pieces are equally strong or your pieces worse than the opponent's piece so do not trade when you have a very powerful very powerful piece and fourth last one but the most important be patient you are an exchange up you're winning but it might take you 20 30 40 or 50 moves until you win the game you should be patient you will never be winning on the spot these are most of the times positional advantages so i hope that you found these principles useful and the examples that we have seen i will see you next week with a new episode of my strategies middle game show
See you then.